Thank you very much for that introduction. I'd like to start by thanking the Cape Times and Prof Noakes and Corin for an invitation to come back to the best city in the world. I can't tell you how amazing it feels to be home. So I'm going to share my story um, and my experiences about LCHF, which we define as low carb, healthy fat. So some of you might know I trained as a dietitian in Cape Town and Prof Noakes actually taught me in my undergraduate uh, degree. Of course we know that half of what he taught me was rubbish. But, um, <laughs> I, I've since forgiven him for that. Um, after my training, I moved across to New Zealand where I've been working ever since. So I worked for a few years in public health and then uh, moved into academia. And I've been a private practice dietitian throughout my uh, 20 years of, of being a registered dietitian. So I've been very loyal to the Dietitians Board and New Zealand Registered Dietitians. And I've also been very loyal to our current food pyramid and our current nutrition guidelines up until around three years ago. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I changed my mind. And it was a combination of evidence, logic and practice that, that, that made me do this. I'm not a rebel. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm actually really good. In fact, a recent uh, school friend of mine said she can't believe what I'm doing because all she did at school was to try and get me to do something wrong, and I never did. <laughs> so I'm obviously making up for lost time. So we have, um, we have a New Zealand version of Prof Tim Noakes, um, and his name is Prof Grant Schofield, and I work closely with him. And about three years ago, he started ranting, ranting about, about banting. And, and I, as a, as a loyal dietitian, I wanted to shut him up. So I thought what I was going to do is I was going to come up with the evidence to show him why our current guidelines were right and the way forward. And I couldn't do that. I looked through the evidence and I couldn't find good research. I found some research, but I couldn't find good research to justify why we were eating how we were eating. Of course, al alongside the fact that we are getting fat and sick didn't really match in terms of you know, fitting the pieces of the puzzle together. But what I did discover is that the evidence for LCHF way of eating and way of thinking made a lot more sense to me from a physiological point of view and from a logical point of view. For example, diabetes, which is a problem of carbohydrate intolerance. Why are we managing diabetes with carbohydrate, with the very thing that we are intolerant to? So that logic came through, and I, and I thought, I'm embarrassed for the fact that throughout my dietetic training, I didn't even ask that question. And that's the nature of the training around the world. You don't ask questions. You just take what the professors tell you as, as how it is. So after reading the evidence, I was convinced. And this was a very, very confusing time for me. As a dietitian, I thought, what am I going to do with my clients? What am I going to do with my students? How am I going to eat? I've had margarine in, 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 the, in the fridge for years. Um, how am I going to change that to butter when I'm not even convinced myself? So it was a very confusing time for me. When you look at all the people around the world who've changed their minds, a lot of them come from their own personal stories. So di you know, people who are diabetes, people have sugar addiction, people have autoimmune disease. So they tell their stories and they've got this personal investment into why they've changed. Now, sorry folks, I believe that I've got the best story. I take the cake, the low-carb cake, of course, in terms of stories. And my story is so good because I have no story. I've never been overweight and I'm likely never to be overweight. I don't have a health problem at, at this stage and hopefully won't. But I changed my mind because I, I, I really believe that this is a superior way of eating to our current guidelines. Who can argue with eating whole, unprocessed foods? The percentage of carbohydrate and fat, it'll work itself out. We need to focus on eating whole, unprocessed, unpackaged foods as much as possible. So then I decided to, to engage in some practice. So of course, 
what every good scientist does um, before they change things publicly is experiment on themselves. So I, I started changing my diet, and of course I didn't feel any different because I felt good beforehand. But what I did notice is that I was not a slave to food. Instead of eating every, two, every one to two to three hours in a day, I ate three times a day, and sometimes even twice a day, because that worked for me. I wasn't constantly climbing the walls from hunger. And that the only way I can describe that to you is a, a feeling of calm. I feel like I'm calm. I don't climb the walls. If I've got back-to-back -back clients and I don't eat for six hours, so be it. Quite different to how, how I used to feel. So then I launched this on my clients. And I still remember sitting with my first client in my office, telling them to have butter and instead of margarine and to have full-fat milk and cheese and things like that. Literally, I can still feel my hair was standing on end. I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? But that was three years ago, and, um, and I've never looked back. So before I sold my cell publicly to the LCHF devil, I did decide to check the um, dietitian's code of ethics, because I didn't want to get into trouble or get you know, kicked off or anything. So what the code of ethics said, um, and I'll read this to you, it said that the dietitian is a reflective practitioner and lifelong learner continually critiquing his or her own performance and improving their standards of practice. Well, this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm critiquing, I'm improving my standards of practice. Plus, the first statement in the Code of Ethics says, the practice of dietetics is informed by evidence and management principles. Now, I believe that I've, we have got the right evidence. It might not be the evidence that aligns with the dietitian's current line of evidence, but it's still good evidence. In fact, it's better evidence. It's better quality studies. And of course, this aligns with every other code of ethics, the Australian code of ethics, the American, the Canadian, and EDSA as well. They are all governed by evidence-based practice. So what's wrong? So then I launched into doing this with, with clients. So I, I went from becoming a, a normal food pyramid best practice person to something which resembles this, whole unprocessed foods, um, a lot more fat. What about saturated fat? Yeah, not vilifying saturated fat. Not necessarily drinking um, bottles of cream and eating blo blocks of butter, but not vilifying saturated fat as, um, as a problem. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I want to talk a little bit about best practice. And best practice is a term that I think that we, and particularly dietitians, throw around a little liberally. And we need to be very careful about that because we need to be very sure about what best practice is. Now, I believe that if we eat a junk food diet, if you eat a tragic, terrible diet, which a lot of people do, and then they change to what resembles our current best practice, there will be positive change. There is no dispute about that. But how can we consider that best practice is if you then change to something that resembles whole unprocessed foods, you can do better in terms of health outcomes. Weight outcomes maybe, health outcomes definitely. So I believe that what we're practicing at the moment is average practice. And we really need to move forward to best practice. Then the complaint started. Um, the initial complaint came after some TV work that we did um, about, about the, this, whole, this whole episode. The big one came when I did this lunchbox thing on TV. They got three women to prepare three lunchboxes for their kids, and they got me to judge it. Everything was packaged in the lunchbox. So I went on TV saying this is appalling, um, and that while sandwiches are okay, white bread sandwiches are okay, whole grain sandwiches are better, but we can do even better. Of course, that was portrayed as, get the sandwiches out of the lunchbox. And anyone who has kids will know that it's a very, very emotional um, <laughs> conversation or debate. So I got totally annihilated from the entire New Zealand population online about my radical views, including um, the dietitians who reported me to the dietitians board. And I had to spend a lot of time rebutting them. And it was painstaking. Um, and this was interesting. Karen Zinn is not fit to be a dietitian. They came from one of my colleagues. So it's a little bit disappointing, but I, again, true to what I believe, whole unprocessed food is the way to go, so I forged ahead. Become very thick-skinned. Hey, Tim. 
Okay, the wave two of complaints came with my Facebook post. So my, my, my professional Facebook page, Karen's and Dietitian. This is a platform where I conduct debate and discussion about various issues of nutrition. Um, I wouldn't say that I give advice, but I certainly put my opinion out there, what I think, um, what I think is you know, good, average, bad, that sort of stuff. Um, and this came from the New Zealand Dietitians Board. They were warning me about my... Um, my behaviour on, on Facebook. So that's fine, I rebutted that, and, and that was great, because the outcome of two formal complaints was that I had a little bit of a warning about what I was saying on Facebook, but on the whole, they were satisfied that my practice of low-carb, healthy-fat nutrition was safe. This is from the New Zealand Dietitians Board, which I think is, is really great, really good. Then the... The Ministry of Health guidelines, which is our national guidelines, there was uh, an opportunity to, to revamp that. Um, and they put this draft document out for discussion, and our group saw it, and we thought this was just tragic because it was just wordsmithing off the current guidelines. So we dropped everything, and for a week we put together this document, 55-page document on why we think the guidelines are not that good, or not good at all. Um, and we submitted it, and as well as that, I sent it round to all the dietitians that are registered in New Zealand for comment. And I said, I'd really like comment on this. In addition to presenting at the dietitians' conference, doing professional development groups um, for the dietitians in the hospital, a lot of work with them to try and influence change. And this document was put out to them for discussion. You think I'm, what, what I'm doing so bad? Let's see what you can say. The response from the dietitians was as follows. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't, you can't bring down some good science if you don't come back with a good rebuttal. We like academic debate. We, we really like it. And that's what's quite good about this hearing is that you are seeing some good academic debate and you are seeing good signs come out, come out from one side anyway. Um, the wave three of complaints um, is what I'm going through at the moment. So the Dietitians Association of Australia have complained to the Dietitians Board New Zealand about my, my um, exposure on Facebook and the things that I'm saying and the fact that I'm public, publicly supporting an Australian dietitian who's just been expelled for doing low-carb diets for, diabe for diabetics. Can you believe it? Yeah. So I'm publicly in support of her, and, and of course they're watching me on Facebook, so they complain about me. And I've just come through the, the Professional Conducts Committee at the moment, and it's likely to be dropped, which is, which is great, but I'm likely to be um, placed under supervision for my uh, Facebook future Facebook posts, which is interesting considering that I'm a dietitian of 20 years experience and I'm in academia, yet I need to be placed under supervision. But we'll deal with that. <laughs> the plot thickens. The Code of Ethics for Dietitians has recently been revamped and has included this, this statement which basically says that you need to be in support or supportive of the Ministry of Health, Food and Nutrition guidelines. So they're stifling debate and they're saying it's one way and one way only. So I'm just waiting for my next complaint because when it comes, it's probably sitting in my inbox at the moment, when it comes I will likely be in breach and I do have some legal support that will take it as high as it's um, going to go because you, you can't do that. No professional body can say it's one line of evidence only. They also say they need to make sure that we need to uphold the integrity of the profession. Now, it might be a good time to thank all the sponsors for the, um, for the New Zealand Dietitians Board and the Australian Di Dietitians Board for aligning themselves with these organisations and making sure that the dietitians promote unbiased health messages on the topic of integrity. Um, so the last few minutes, I just want to talk to you about the top three anti-LCHF arguments that dietitians might use. And you know all of this, but the reason why I'm putting this up there is because you are the people who are going to be disseminating the message. And when people say to you, you shouldn't be doing this for these reasons, you need to have the arguments, you need to have the, um, the words to say, no, I, I'm doing this and, and this is why I'm doing it. So hopefully you can 
th th this can help you rebut some of those critics that look at you as if you're a little strange. The first one, saturated fat will give you heart disease. Now, I'm not going to get into the science of this because it's complex, but the bottom line is actually quite simple. In that when it was originally linked, when saturated fat was originally linked with heart disease, saturated fat being animal fat, right? When, when it was initially linked, the type of research that made that link was not very good. Correlation-based research, this is associated with that. No cause and effect. And there was a massive political argument behind it. And when that correlation was actually put forward, there was actually a higher correlation between sugar and heart disease, but that was, you know, that was pushed under the table. The more recent publications of saturated fat and heart disease and the more nuanced understanding of lipid fractions in relation to heart disease is clearly showing that saturated fat does not cause heart disease. Okay? We don't need to vilify saturated fat. Now, if you have um, some cream in your donut, that's, that's not what we're promoting. Okay? <laughs> saturated fat, in the context of our current toxic environment, our current westernized diet, is not healthy. No one's, no one's saying that. But saturated fat or animal fat from whole unprocessed foods in the context of whole foods, LCHF, is not harmful at all. In fact, it's actually beneficial. Again, I'll say it doesn't, we, we don't necessarily need to eat blocks of butter and drink um, bottles of cream, but we need to get away from vilifying saturated fat as the bad guy because it's not. Second one, the dietitians say that LCHF, and remember LCHF is a spectrum, the spectrum, is restrictive and lacks variety. So this is, um, this is a picture of, I'm not sure if everyone can see it um, as, as beautifully as I can, but it's a picture of nine dinner meals that were sent, were sent to me by one of my clients who was doing the ketogenic diet, which is the extreme end of LCHF, okay? And she's a, she's a boxer, um, a, a, an athlete, a really good athlete, and, um, and she sends me photos regularly of her meals. Now, what about that looks restrictive or lacks variety to you? I don't know. It's a matter of perception. It's totally a matter of perception. Plus, I mean, I will argue that in life, life is all about restriction. You can't just go through a red, a, a red robot if you're in a hurry. You know, you've got to wait. Life is all about restriction. There's a healthy amount of restriction that goes with anything. So, in the old days, we restri restricted fat for no good reason, but now we're restricting carbohydrate for good reason, that, it's not, that our carbohydrate-based foods are typically not aligned with how nature intended us to eat. And the final one, and this is the classic one, they'll say that you'll end up with nutrient deficiencies. Okay, because whole grain bread gives you lots of B vitamins and fiber, and if you, if you take that out of your diet, you're going to be walking around with flapping tremor, which is B, vitamin B1 deficiency. So let's look at that a little bit. What I've done is I have, I've analyzed two diets, okay? Now this is based on my colleague Grant, who's a 47-year-old male, who's reasonably active at the moment, so don't necessarily look at the amounts of foods. We're not talking about amounts, but I've put the amounts on just to show you what I've done for my analysis. So a typical brick, uh, best practice way of eating. Uh, for breakfast, we've got some cereal, maybe some grain-based cereal with some skim milk and, and a banana. Uh, apologies if it's a bit small and you can't see, but I'll, I'll talk it through. For lunch, we've got a sandwich with some margarine and some greenery on there, lettuce, tomato, you know, cucumber, that sort of thing. A bit of low-fat shaved ham and some tomato relish. For dinner, we've got stir-fried chicken and vegetable pasta. And for snacks, because we need snacks, because we're hungry all the time, um, we've got some fruit toast with some margarine, just, just a drop. We've got some low-fat yogurt, an apple, a mandarin, and some sports drink because this person got on a bike for an hour, so we need sports drink. <laughs> so just keep that etched in your, in your brain just for a minute. LCHF diet, enter the LCHF diet or, the, or, or lifestyle. Omelet for breakfast, a couple of eggs with some greenery, spinach or kale, uh, some capsicum, throw a bit of... Uh, cheese in there cooked in coconut oil or butter. I just use coconut oil just because. Uh, salmon salad, so a, a, a tin of salmon with, 
a good variety of vegetables in there, plus a bit of cheese and some olives and some olive oil. Glad we talk the same language, I see. Uh, and then dinner, we've got a small amount of, of meat. So again, this is another thing. People think this is all about protein. It's not. This is a palm-sized portion of meat, probably smaller than what we'd like. This is all we need. Plus some pumpkin, courgettes, eggplant. And you might say, but some of these are quite high-carb vegetables. They might be, but let's see how it pans out. Snacks. So we've got some mixed nuts. We just threw some snacks in there, not because we're hungry, but just we needed to match the calories of both of the diets. So we've got in some mixed nuts, and we've got some berries and some natural high-fat Greek yogurt. Let's have a bit of a comparison. So both diets give you around 2,300 calories. That's a lot higher for some people, a lot lower for some people. So don't necessarily write that down and aim for that. We're not, we don't like counting calories. But the two diets are pretty equal in calories. Best practice is around 65%, so just under 400 grams of carbs, whereas LCHF, we've got 67 grams of total, total carb. Okay? A, very, um, a, a diet which has a, a wide variety of foods, uh, th there's no major restriction, there's beautiful, tasty foods, we've got 67 grams of carbs. Protein, it just so happens that it's an extra serve of protein in LCHF just because it, it's worked out that way, not intentional. Um, and the fat, we've got 14% on, on best practice. And we've got quite a high fat content on this. It doesn't, it's not that high in terms of percentages, but in terms of grams, it's quite high. Um, so that's what it looks like. That's a comparison. So back to the nutrient deficiency conversation. So, so I've plotted all these nutrients on the graph. So just for those who are um, not that familiar, here are all the nutrients at the bottom, so a lot of the, well, the vitamins and minerals. And over here we've got a percentage of the RDI, which is the recommended daily intake. And the idea is, is that we need to be 100% or over the RDI. We need to make sure we meet our nutrient requirements every day. Okay? So you can see this, this diet doesn't meet for vitamin A, vitamin D, or magnesium. Okay, so what, what, what's happening there? Do they have something, you know, do they have a good cause for saying you, you're going to be deficient? Well, they might have, but it's the best practice diet. So if you take our current guidelines and you construct a diet and you put it through a computer program, you'll see that that actually doesn't meet nutrient requirements. So, you know, pot calling kettle black. We need to be very, very careful. When you look at the LCHF diet, it meets all requirements. And in fact, the fiber content, and this has been a, this has been a classic argument, oh, it's really low in fiber and the gut needs bacteria and all this stuff. Fiber's fine, but you don't see a piece of whole grain bread in there whatsoever. So we get ample fiber, ample soluble fiber from vegetables. So here's an argument you can use. Um, and I have to say that LCHF way of eating needs to be well formulated. You can do it badly. You can eat LCHF foods badly. If you had you know, bacon for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and no vegetables, that's not ideal. It needs to be lots of vegetables and lots of variety. You need to do it properly. So you might be asking, why, why do I bother? Why don't I just get deregistered? Because it actually doesn't really affect my job. Um, and, and the reality is, is that I do it for one reason. And that one reason is that Dietitians, if any of you are here, you will know that you tend to trust your own. So I like to influence from within, and I feel like I'm actually making some good progress, making some really good progress. So this might not seem like good progress to you, because I've only got 41 people in this group, but I've established an LCHF <laughs> Dietitians Facebook page from around the world, only 41, um, but it's growing. It, you know, it took me a long time to change my mind. If you spent your entire career doing one thing, we can't expect people to go, oh, okay then, I'll just change. So it's going to take time. Dietitians are very conservative people. We are very conservative. So we need to, and there are some dietitians in, in South Africa and in Cape Town who are changing their minds and working this way, which is really, really lovely to see. So my role, my new mission in life is to, is to help the dietitians, is to give them the evidence and to share my practice with them. Even, I'm even working with some Australian dietitians um, to, to, um, to give them the, the tools of how they can do this in their practice. 
So that's the reason why I'm, I'm bothering um, and I'm coming up against, against some nasty people. And I think it's a totally, totally worthwhile cause. Um, like anyone who, who's in the industry, we have to write a book. But we, we wrote a book. <laughs> we wrote a book purely to get the message out. Okay, the book's called What the Fat? Um, and great title, I know. I'd love to take credit for that, but I can't. Um, and it's on ebook, and we're just uh, launching next week. Uh, we're launching our What the Fat uh, for sports performance on, on ebook. So we, we've been successful in changing or in spreading the message in, in New Zealand and, and to a certain extent in, in Australia, exactly what you guys are doing here. So finally, I just want to say one parting message, and my parting message is it's all very well that you've got people like Prof Noakes and Karen and Asim and myself doing, doing this stuff, and yeah, it's, it's, it's great. But change, real change will come if you guys spread, spread the word, okay? So it's up to each and every one of you to make sure that you've got good arguments and good rebuttals in your mind and you spread the message and in the interim we need to sit back and realize that change at the high level will come. We just need to be patient. Yes. Thank you.